Harvard Divinity School. Religion in Times of Earth Crisis, Animal Stories in Crisis, February 12th, 2024. And welcome to our third in our six-part series, Religion in Times of Earth Crisis. I'm Diane Moore. I'm the Associate Dean of Religion and Public Life here at Harvard Divinity School. And on behalf of myself and our Dean, Marla Frederick, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation. This series is sponsored by Religion and Public Life and co-sponsored with our colleagues at the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard University, the Center for the Study of World Religions here at the Divinity School, the Constellation Project, and Harvard X. I want to pause and uh, give a land an acknowledgement of land and people, so please join me for this. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Webinars like this um, have always multiple hands minds and hearts behind them. And I want to thank my colleagues at Religion and Public Life who uh, behind the scenes helped create this series to advertise it, to help make sure that technical issues are taken care of. Rochelle Sway, Rima Tassi, Tammy Liao, Natalie Campbell from Religion and Public Life. Thank you, my dear friends and colleagues. I also want to thank our Office of Communication, which did a terrific job advertising this, and especially to the miraculous Christy Welch, who created the beautiful posters that animate our series. And finally, Kamal Lord, our IT specialist, who helped make sure that we had the bandwidth to be able to run this program. This entire series was actually um, inspired, if you will, by our colleague Myra Rivera, who was the 2022 president of the American Academy of Religion, the, um, the Professional Association for Scholars of Religion. And she gave a remarkable presidential address entitled, What is the Role of Religion in Times of Catastrophe? And Myra offered uh, the first in our series with some new work building on what she did in the uh, presidential address and also some new work um, but I want to read from that presidential address and also from a quote from Amitav Ghosh from the Nutmeg's Curse, who also has helped inspired our way of thinking about this series of conversations. So this is from Myra Rivera's 2022 presidential address. We need a more capacious sense of collectivity that can only emerge when we are willing to honor our stories and tell the truth about injustices that have shaped both environmental devastation and responses to it, a world of our many worlds. And this from Amitav Ghosh. This is the great burden that now rests upon writers, artists, filmmakers, and everyone else who's involved in the telling of stories. To us falls the task of imaginatively restoring agency and voice to non-humans. As with all the most important artistic endeavors in human history, this is a task that is as at once aesthetic and political. And because of the magnitude of the crisis that besets the planet, it is now freighted with the most pressing moral urgency. And now it is my great warm honor to introduce Taryn Sevilla, our speaker for the evening. Taryn is the Prince Alawalid bin Talal Assistant Professor of Islamic Studies here at Harvard Divinity School. He's a scholar of Islam and Muslim societies in South and Southeast Asia, and he received his PhD in history from the University of California in Los Angeles. Before joining HDS, he served as Assistant Professor of South Asia Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Sevilla is the author of Miracles and Material Life, Rice, or Tropes, Traps, and Guns in Islamic Malaya, uh, Cambridge University Press 2020, which received the 2022 Bunda Prize awarded by the Association of Asian Studies. 
Davia is also edited Islamic Connections, Muslim Societies in South and Southeast Asia. He is currently completing a second book uh, entitled Singapore Islam, The Prophet's Port and Sufism Across the Oceans. And very relevant to our presentation this evening, he's working on his third monograph, provisionally entitled Animal Saints and Sinners, Lessons on Islam and Multispeciesism from the East. And now I will turn it over to you, uh, Professor Sevilla, uh, to offer your presentation for the evening entitled Animal Stories in Crisis. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Diane. And I want to first begin by thanking the organizers. I mean, and please forgive me if I'm not naming all of you, Diane, Rachel, Reem, who are here. Thank you so much for having me and putting all this together. I also want to thank my 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 colleagues, particularly who spoke before me, Myra Rivera and uh, Dan McKinnon, for for laying out for the matter what 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 has been what would really I I hope to carry on in this conversation. I mean, for the matter, Myra Rivera's work, I think, as Diane pointed out, really really kind of reminds us of the need to rework our methods of even approaching the world, reminding us of some of how some of our methods have fallen short, how our scholarly concepts or disciplinary structures, in her words, mm -hmm. you know, often extricate people from the environments. Now, one of the things that Dan, Dan's paper last week was really pushing us up into thinking of relationships with environments, relationships with more than human neighbours, relationships with ancestors, talking about sacred groves and how, for that matter, groves, trees, for that matter, were very much generational and needed to be understood in that way. Now, I, I must say that that coming after my my colleagues, my Rivera and Dan McKinnon, I mean, I... I I I feel I feel that that but I, I feel quite daunted coming after their papers. So, but but let me and especially I I'm gonna start by saying that I'm also I mean, while uh, uh, the paper last week was really positioning us in our our setting. I mean, in the Boston backyard is now I'm really going to take us to a different part of the world today. And one of the things that I I like beginning with, and I hope everybody's fine. Uh, is with maps. And with that, I'm going to shift our attention to... Uh, oh, sorry, I, I hope the... I, excuse me. I, I I hope the PowerPoint presentation is coming up. Yes, it is. You're, you're good. Okay. This one, is great. Thank you. Please do tell me if anything messes up in the process. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to take us... And of, of course, it's all, I'm going to take us from the East Coast further east on this map, and I hope um, the arrow is working, I'm taking us to the Malay Peninsula here, and partly to this part of the world. And our story today, I, want, I mean, the story I'm going to tell today uh, is really beginning in this province of Qadar, or this region of Qadar in, in, uh, in what is present-day West Malaysia. So um, in, in 1957, Hundreds of believers were lining up daily in a village in Qadar to collect and drink the bath water of an infant. Now, this infant was believed and widely believed by these believers to be a karamat. And the term karamat, I mean, itself comes from the, the Arabic term karama. Now, karamat means miracle, miracle worker, saint. Now, it was believed in 1957 that this infant was was a peculiar saint. And he, this infant lived in a village that was 18 miles away from the capital city of the region of Qadar. Now, the name of this infant is hard to trace at the moment, but he was the grandchild of a human villager named Saad bin Haji Yusuf. Now, Saad's grandson was peculiarly miraculous in the sense that, that when he took bath, the particles of his body that mixed into water were believed to have such a talismanic quality that pilgrims from afar were lining up to collect this bath water for consumption and for, for, dis, for conservation and for distribution later, since it was talismanic water. Now, Saad's grandson was a three feet long snake. Now, to be precise, it was a Saad's grandson was a three feet long reticulated python, a male, 
reticulated python. Now, this the the python, uh, the reticulated python had appeared to Saad, his grandfather, his human grandfather, in a dream, and spoken to him about how his loss of habitat had led him to come to be adopted by this human family. Now, what Saad would what the reticulated python did in this case would that he would appear to his grandfather, his human grandfather in a dream, and tell him that he was going to appear in his human mother's house, who was Saad's daughter. Now, after appearing to his grandfather in a dream, the reticulated python appeared in the house of the mother he chose to be adopted by, a human mother. Now, upon now he would initially he would not be welcome. I mean, because the couple were debating about what to what to do with the reticulated python that appeared. Indeed, uh, Saad's daughter's husband or Saad's son-in-law would indeed chase the snake away, but the snake would return. And in, upon returning, the family would confer and realize that the snake had already appeared to the patriarch in the family in the dream and spoken about its intentions to be adopted. Now, what would happen? is that the family would readily adopt the snake. And very quickly, it will be realized by villagers uh, and, and people beyond the, the village that this family lived in that the snake was miraculous and was a saintly figure. Now, miracle stories of the snake started spreading and that's why there were lines of pilgrims lining up to collect the bath water of this, of this miraculous snake. Now, what would happen at this moment of time was that not everybody was convinced by the saint's miraculous powers. Uh, particularly an Islamic judge would come and when, would criticize believers who were lining up and argue that, that while saints were central to, to Islam, in his terms, he would argue that the figure of a saint or a karamat was an indisputably human one. Now, Islamic, uh, this, this Islamic judge like some of his contemporaries, was the opinion that, 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 that believers were believing that caves, rocks, islands, whirlpools, volcanoes, trees, and a plethora of animals were miracle workers and saints in himself. And this was something that he was theologically challenging. Nevertheless, I do want to highlight here that, that in spite of his preaching and attempts that he, he made to circulate his opinions, he, he was very unsuccessful because of the fact that even rival rival Islamic scholars and believers were challenging his opinion on this. Now, eventually, quite desperately, this Islamic judge would collaborate with a policeman to steal the reticulated python from its parents' house and take it away. Now, shortly after his abduction, the Saad's grandson, the reticulated python, would, would be found physically dead. Nevertheless, after his physical death, a shrine would be built in the village to commemorate the Karamat or the Islamic saint. Now, he was this Saad's grandson was not the only animal Karamat or animal saint to appear. Animal saints would continue to appear, and as they did in the past. In 1965, in 1965, a Muslim woman in Malacca, and I would point that out on the map here. A Muslim woman in Malacca in 1965 would actually physically deliver a biological child that was a snake. And this child was delivered together with a human twin. Now, this woman was described as the wife of a man called Mokhtar Baba. Now, nevertheless, the human parents would, be in, would very soon be renowned as the, the parents, the biological parents of an Islamic saint or a karamat. Within months, by August or September 1965, Mokhtar's snake child would be venerated as a popular saint. Now, thousands of Muslims were, were described as visiting the house of these, this snake, Mokhtar's, Mokhtar's son, and basically offering providing water offerings for the young saint. Now, Mokhtar would have would would receive so much, so many, I mean, such an abundant amount of votive offerings that eventually in November 1965, he used to a whole bunch of this money to organize a huge feast in the main mosque of the town that he lived in. Now, this 
this this feast was was well reportedly well attended by by a multi species audience, not just human believers, but even even animals in the vicinity who came to join the feast. Now I do want to point. It, I mean, we have uh, we have some newspaper reports on this feast that would happen also, and here you have. If you look on the, the ultimate left and on the right, the feast is being reported together with the Kennedy's visit to Malaysia here, right, in the newspaper article. Now, as, as it's probably clear from these examples, I mean, beyond the fact that I do want to point out here that the one thing that struck me when I keep hearing of these stories of these, these animal kin, be they adopted or be they biological kin, is, is kind of uh, Donna Haraway's point on making kin and one of the whole points that she makes that kin is perhaps the hardest and most urgent part of dealing with this earth crisis that we are dealing with now now one of the things is that kin is making kin making is making persons and i think she very strikingly says go outside english and the world the wild multiplies now beyond the kinship element here that i would return to later now one thing that's striking in many of these animal stories more of which i would like to share here is that it's these stories are clearly not about human spiritualizing nature. And much of the scholarship on, on religion, on, on Islam, very much is human-centered at times. Now, these stories are beginning on animal studies, animals as, as sources of Islam, sources of religion. Now, for that matter, I mean, beyond that, these stories are really opening up to connections, not only across multi-species planes, but between the seen and unseen. And one of the things that I will turn to. Now, we're reading Amitabh Ghosh's Nutmeg's Curse that Diane refers, referred to very kindly earlier. I think one of the things that Ghosh leaves us at the end of the book is really speaking about islands like the Banda Islands as Tana Barakat or something like Earth of Charismatic Religious Authority or Baraka, coming from the Islamic concept Baraka. Now, these animals, for that matter, were believed to be bodies or Baraka bodies a charismatic religious authority, bodies, receptacles of this baraka. Now, one of the things I also want to highlight here from is to just high point out here that, I mean, as, as, as perhaps the stories I, I hope really conveyed, if I hope I did them justice in conveying that, is that animals were possessed personhood, individuality, they possessed souls, they possessed internet, intentionality, they possess genealogies, ancestries, and also languages and even voices in participating in communications with humans. And I think this will be very central to many of the stories I'd like to share today. But before I go ahead, one of the things that I just have to highlight, and I go back here to Amitabh Ghosh's Nanmax curse here, is one of the things that, that it is, as he highlights, is, is how there's a kind of idea here <clears throat> on something that has been inherited, as, as Ghosh argues, from European colonial projects of assuming that it's primitive, that it's it's primitive communities that believe in the vital spirits of animals, landscapes, environments, etc. Now, for that matter, I think one of the things that Ghosh points out here is that this is really a point a philosophical premise that underlies many academic dis disciplines at times. Now, of course, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, <coughs> now he says that the thing is to recognize that non-humans can do and must speak. The reason I'm just speak, referring to this is that I want to turn us, in since I'm working in the Malay context, I think one thing that I want to begin with is some of the some of the scholarship that emerged for the matter from the eight in the nineteenth century onwards on these charismatic megafauna or even smaller charismatic animals from the Malay world. Now, for that matter, a one of the leading scholars of Malay stud Malay studies in the nineteenth century was a figure W. E. Maxwell. William Maxwell was on the on the right was the assistant resident of a state of Perak. Sorry, I'm just going to flipping through slides to just point out here. We have Pera here on the, the northwest of the Malay Peninsula. Now, writing in 1881, William Maxwell would argue that Islam had failed to stamp out the deep-rooted feelings which prompted the, open inverted commas, and the words of Maxwell here, very inappropriate words, the savage to invest the wild beast with the character of deities. 
Now, Maxwell was partly struggled, troubled by the fact that, that for him, wherever he went in Pera in it, the 1870s for that matter, he kept meeting individuals who were respecting animals as, as saintly or possessing souls, intentionality, and voices. Now, one of the things that Maxwell was, one encounter that Maxwell described indeed, was how once he had indeed had his own guns, in his, in his words, his gun barrels locked up to fire at a passing crocodile in, in Pera, in a village in Pera, and he was ready for this hunt. But he was prevented from doing so by a number of his Malay Muslim intermediaries who, who begged him not to fire upon a crocodile because they argued that that specific crocodile was a karamat or an Islamic saint and needed to be respected and could not be violated. Now, Maxwell, as I said, was the assistant resident of Pera. But Maxwell's son, William George Maxwell, uh, would become the acting resident of Pera a, almost a decade later. The younger Maxwell would write a, this book here in Malay Forest that I put up. And one of the things that, that he would describe in this book is how he very proudly hunted a one-horned Javan rhino. Now, for those who are familiar with rhinoceroses uh, and in the Malay world, for that matter, the one-horned Javan rhino is now extinct thanks to the efforts of, of hunters like Maxwell. But in, it, but in 1899, William George Maxwell actually hunted this rhino in a valley called the Pinji Valley in Pera, Kinta district. Now, what he would do, and I'm sorry, this is not the image, an accurate image, but I just put up an image of a rhino, sorry. But one thing that William George Maxwell would do is upon hunting this rhino, he would decapitate the rhino and put the head of the rhino in the Salango Museum, in a separate state, in a museum for display. Now, one, now strikingly, William, William Maxwell thought that he had dealt with this rhino, rhino well. In, in killing it, hunting it, putting it in the museum. But nevertheless, one of the things that would, he would be, I mean, he'd be struck by was how, for that matter, the rhino was venerated as an Islamic saint, a karamat. The rhino's blood would be collected, the rhino, the dead, the physically dead rhino's blood would be collected for co coagulation. Now his other sacred body parts were preserved for medicinal purposes. Beyond that, what struck a number of European observers, and for that matter, as believers' stories recount, was even when the decapitated head of this rhino was placed in a museum, it would become a pilgrimage site, where believers would go to the, the museum and in their words, place themselves, go and visit the museum for the divine presence or the darshan of the karamat or the Islamic saint in the museum. Now, Maxwell clearly was struck by the fact that, in his words, staunch Mus Mohammedans, in his words, or staunch Muslims, continue to respect these wild elephants, crocodiles, tigers, rhinoceroses, as vessels of spirits or reincarnations of DC celebrities. Now, for him, I mean, he, he felt that this was simply something that, in his words, was, the, was a very naive, primitive way, in his words, where a beast an animal's ferocity, its daring and its cunning, or its fortunes to escape a few ill-directed bullets allowed it in a few years to be considered a saint. Now, what was going on, be, what, 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 the, what Maxwell was almost el eluding here was the fact that, that rhinoceros human, you know, rhinoceros human encounters. Now, for that matter, Maxwell had spotted this rhinoceros, this Pinji Valley rhinoceros, and heard about his encounters with humans. Now, there are other megafauna that were increasingly at this period of time coming into encounters with humans. Now, animals, uh, animals like elephants, for that matter, often trapped from the interior of Pera, for that matter, were very much coming to human human encounters and at times unpleasant human encounters because of the development in the late 19th century of roads, railways, the employment and exploitation of migrant laborers in, in large-scale construction projects. Now, beyond that, the colonial state 
was really encouraging a development from Sweden to set, settle agriculture. They was leading to the depletion of forested landscapes and even secondary forested landscapes that served as food sources for a number of these animals, including elephants. Now, as a, as a as an environmental historian, uh, Faiza Zakat, Zakaria's work recently reminds us, and I will come back to this, then one of the things that would happen in this massive development in the late 19th century would lead, would, we'll find the elephants encroaching on rubber plantations that were coming up on the cultivated fields that were appearing. Now, this would, this would lead, for that matter, in lead the colonial administration for them in Malaya to encourage elephant killings for them and elephant huntings. Now, indeed, the colonial government, as we learn from these works and environmental historians in Malaya, would even encourage ivory market where the colonial administration would even award tasks to people who were, who were shooting the elephants in between the 1880s and 1900s because of these, the fact that these animals were really appearing on plantations and agriculture, agriculture zones. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the things that I do want to highlight here is that, that it's not, I, I don't want to create a kind of simple radical alterity that, that really was Europeans promoting a hunting culture. There were native, uh, there were for that matter Malay trappers, there were Malay Muslim trappers, Malay Islamic trappers, non-Malay trappers in the Malay Peninsula. And what we have is a series of Islamic manuscripts here, and I pulled up some Malay Islamic manuscripts. They really describe elephant trapping practices before, before this, uh, these hunting practices that I just spoke about emerged in the late 19th century. Now, one, was, one, one thing that was quite striking as these manuscripts really show us is that a number of figures who were spirit mediums or themselves miracle workers were often called pawangs, P-A-W-A-N-G. Pawangs were central to the trapping of elephants. Now, as a couple of these manuscripts tell us, pawangs, for that matter, would, would go into forests, search for elephants, inspect them, use all kinds of trapping tactics, including seducing male elephants, trap them, build enclosures, and then train these elephants. Now, these texts are, are definitely, these are not texts of conservationists or environmentalists. These are texts of elephant trappers. But nevertheless, one of the things that's crucial that was different with this hunting culture was the fact that Pawans interacted physically with elephants. In this world of even violence, there was interaction with the use of everything. That, from the use, from Elephant bodies, elephant souls were spoken to. Beyond that, even in building enclosures, trees individually were mediated. Now, what was crucial as this text show, for every stage of elephant trapping or building an enclosure, these, these Malay Islamic trappers would speak to the spirits of animals they were trapping, speak to the spirits of trees they were cutting, etc. Now, what we find here is that as Radhika Govindarajan reminds us in her work on, on mountainous communities in North India, that even violence does not preclude attending to animals at times. And this was something that was central to these stories. Now, nevertheless, one of the things that, that, that we find is that, and, and one of, that the kind of, deep, that in, it's really what changes as environmental historians remind us of Malaya, is with this hunting culture, that kind of engagement with animals really takes us away from that. Now, as, as one of the things that we find is that it's really in this period, as I said, of the colonial state promoting a hunting culture, be it of elephants, be it of rhinoceroses, be it of tigers, as I would turn to, that even in the, the scale of hunting that, that will lead to the extinction of right, certain rhinoceroses, that will lead to the large decrease of number of elephants in the late 19th century in the Malay Peninsula. What we find, according to Zakaria, is that a kind of that stories in, from this period, on the, while the colonial state is promoting that, we can trace a number of stories that continue to be disseminated through oral traditions or contained in manuscripts like this on, for that matter, the spirituality of elephants. Now, for that matter, I have an image here of towns being named after charismatic elephants. Now, one of the 
the one a prominent mining town. And I mean, for those of us, I mean, I should probably point it out that late 19th century Malaya was the largest producer of tin, alluvial tin. Now, for the matter, tin mining towns will be named after charismatic elephants. Now, on the other hand, the number, the number of stories, and I am I should apologize here that. One thing that I was struck by in manuscripts and oral traditions is the abundance of stories on 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 these charismatic, uh, saintly animals, and I only be able to share some. Now, at this moment of time, as hunting is going on, while mining towns are really clear, mining road construction, um, anything from coffee plantation to rubber plantations are really chasing depleting habitats. What is emerging is so many. So many animal stories of uh, stories of these charismatic elephants. Now, for that matter, from the mining town of Klang in in, in Salango, in also West Malaysia, West Malaya for that matter, in the 1890s, one particular saintly elephant was shot down. Now, according to all miracle stories, now it took about 50 to 60 bullets to shoot this elephant and to kill it. But nevertheless, Upon its death, now no killing of a saint was to remain unpunished. What it did was it led to a major depletion in the value of the of the local coffee and and the, the value of the coffee land that was something very driven by European planters. Now, nevertheless, as I probably have already pointed out, I mean it wasn't just uh, all animals had had their saints. Now in 1931. A celebrity crocodile hunter, Elias Jamin, would shoot a 28 feet long crocodile in, in the southern state of Johor. Now, the crocodile was shot to the head, all right, but, to, but nevertheless, Jamin himself would remark on the fact that how he so shocked he was by the fact that the crocodile survived, and immense miracle stories would emerge on this crocodile. Now, I do very quickly, but I I mean, I can't get into this, that, that these manuscripts that I'm showing here also, beyond the stories I'm telling, contain genealogies of, of, of animals. Now, in these manuscripts, elephants have a genealogy where they, they are linked to figures from epics like the Mahabharata and Ramayana. Beyond that, beyond that many of these animals have Islamic genealogies. The crocodile, for that matter, is linked to being a plaything of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. And there are very elaborate genealogies in this that they remind individuals of the fact that they really can't take animals lightly, you know, that beyond the fact that certain animals are saints. Now, now of course, I mean, and I, I can't speak about the fact that, uh, I, I mean, I'm going to very quickly summarize a few stories here. But at the same moment of time, since I was speaking about crocodiles, at the same moment of time that, that we, with with the 19th, with the with the course of the late 19th century, early 20th century, really depletions of swamps, marshes in the Malay Peninsula, and the the rise of open cast mines. What we are finding here is we're finding multiple animal miracle stories of of sorry, multiple stories of these charismatic, saintly crocodiles described at times of described as growing the lengths of about 30 feet long and living up to a century long, some of which were multicolored crocodiles by themselves. Now, these crocodiles are often called karamat buaya or, 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 or crocodile scenes or crocodile miracle workers. And one thing that was striking was that in both, in both oral traditions, uh, manus Malay Islamic manuscripts, and in European accounts, we find multiple records of a plethora of shrines that were developed around these figures. Now, indeed, in many of these in many of these stories of these crocodiles, there was a clear recognition of the fact of the loss of habitat and the the how loss of habitat and poaching for for crocodile skin skin would have environmental impacts. Now, for that matter, according to reports in 1926 and 27 and, and miracle stories, a catastrophic flood that was possibly connected to La Nina was, not, was caused by one important reason. This was caused by the fact that a leak, a pact that had been made between crocodiles and humans in the past had been contravened. 
Now, this pact had been contravened because of the fact that humans had started removing the uh, crocodile habitats and started poaching crocodiles for Thai crocodile skin on a very incre you know, increasing scale by the turn of the century. Now, this, this would result in widespread floods from Pera to, ja Pera to Malacca, as, as shown in the map earlier. Now, according to miracle accounts, according to miracle accounts, after belligerent hunters started poaching crocodiles in the Pera River, the king of crocodiles, a saint by himself, would crawl ashore and then plunge back to the river and dig a hole in his bed and allow the earth's center to well up to submerge human settlements from Pera to Kuala Lumpur to Kelantan. So basically half of the Malay Peninsula, as I shown on the map earlier, was submerged by these catastrophic floods. And according to most, uh, both miracle stories and newspaper reports, this was the reason why it was there. Now I want to move here to, I, just in the, uh, just keeping track of time, to really an animal, an animal that draws a lot of attention in and in these miracle stories and reports. Now, tigers. Now, very quickly, and sorry if I, I mean, I'd be happy to discuss this more in the Q&A, but one of the things that I want to really very quickly round up, uh, summarize is the fact that tigers, the Malayan tiger, now really dwindled in numbers. I mean, we're speaking of a few hundred at times and optimistically, is that really tigers thrived in ecotones between forests and newly cleared land. Now, in the late in the late 19th and early 20th century, we found agriculture, like agriculture expansion, road building, things that I've really spoken about, really drive, really driving tiger human encounters. Now, tigers, for that matter, even in a city like Singapore, for that matter, it was by 1856, it was being described that not a day passes, I quote, without a destruction of one human being by this ferocious beast. Now, tigers were appearing in urban settlements with the loss of habitat. Now, they were described as walking around towns at times. Now, very much, they were even losing their ecotones where they were fine and they were looking for other spaces. Now, in response to the loss of habitat and increasing human encounters in the late 19th century, to safeguard plantations and the economy, now, tip, perhaps typically, one of the things that colonial officials started doing and beyond that, European planters really supported was the capturing and killing of tigers. Now, it was being promoted as a trade of selling the hides of tigers. Beyond that, tiger clubs and particularly one tiger club was established in the pen peninsula to, to promote the recreational hunting of tigers and giving hefty rewards to plantation owners who allowed who 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 killed tigers when who entered their properties? Now, but there are other stories. Now, this is one one side of tiger human encounters that was celebrated by these tiger clubs and tiger hunts. But there was another side of tiger human context that was told in other stories, in other Islamic stories that were turned to. For that matter, in the night from the night in the nineteen twenties, it was reportedly very common for Muslims in the state of Nagri Sambilan, and I'm um, sorry, I'm just going to flip through slides here. And this is Nagri Sambilan. And for Muslim, it was in the 1920s, it was, purport, it was described as very common for Muslims in Nagri Sambilan to interact intimately with tigers because of the fact that tigers were believed to widely embody the souls of ancestors. Now, this really gets me to the anecdotes I started with on kinship. Now, for that matter, now we have oral traditions and beyond that, we have the writings of a Malay Muslim scholar, Zainal Abidin, on this from the 1920s. They really describe the fact very richly that in, me, uh, that, that in, in the region of Nagri Samilan and beyond, it was believed that tigers had a post-burial metamorphosis, that their souls transmig that, that basically what happened was that it was believed that human ancestors after their burial had souls transmigrated into the bodies of tigers. Now, these tigers embodying the souls of dead human ancestors would up, were appearing in human villages. So let's, let me just uh, very quickly recap this. This is a moment of time that the loss of natural habitats, the animals are really appearing. These tigers are appearing in human spaces. Now, now one of the things that's being, being these stories are really showing cult, 
community, how communities interacted with these tigers appearing spaces and understood them as embodying the souls of dead ancestors. Now, indeed, there are rich accounts of how individuals could telepathically communicate with their tigers, speaking to them in person, speaking to them through dreams, and beyond that, how tigers, for that matter, could communicate with humans, displaying gestures, bodily features, including teeth types, including a gold, gold teeth, for that matter, that they had inherited from their earlier human form. Now, indeed, one of the things that was quite striking here was that these tigers, after their death, were being buried as family saints also. Now, but, but I just want to point out what else tigers did. The tigers were being respected because they lived with their human families upon being adopted by them. They protected the human homes from rival, rival, rival animals that were hostile and other humans that were hostile. Beyond that, they would even, and with living with their human families, they received all kinds of things, food, clothes, accessories, ropes, turbans, neck chains, and they stayed there. Now, one of the things that would strike, strike uh, Anglo, uh, English writing observers of these tigers was the fact that on Islamic festivals like Eids, for that matter, uh, tigers would come and celebrate the festivals with their human relatives in their homes. Now, they were described by English speaking observers as the Malay equivalents of Santa Clauses. All right. Now, another thing that these tigers often did, and I want to very quickly skim through here for the, uh, the benefit of time, is that they were also not just festive, they were recognized as lawgivers. Throughout Malaya and throughout the Malay Peninsula, there were tigers were appearing at Sufi shrines. And what they were doing at the Sufi shrines were actually pro um, ensuring that there were no transgressions of codes of conduct. Now, for that matter, they would they would not only, for that matter, scare away those who did not want to partake in the codes of conduct. They would terrorize transgressors. Now, indeed, one of the things that we strikingly find beyond the oral traditions is that one a uh, a straight a civil servant of the straight settlements called Charles Blackden would start touring with with Malay Muslims and pulling Malay Muslim pilgrims to many of the shrines of the Malay Peninsula in the early twentieth century. Uh, sorry, in the late nineteenth century. In the eighteen nineties, he left a series of unpublished books on these shrines, capturing the reports, traditions, testimonies of believers at these shrines. Now, what we hear about is how tigers, for that matter, not only regulated. Uh, prayers at these shrines, but beyond that, ensured the norms of comportment were kept. Now, this this is not something new because I mean, even today, at many shrines, we would find in in the Malay Peninsula how waters, animals, rocks, etc., were believed are still believed to police transgressions at these shrine spaces. Now, I just want to add one more thing about tigers. Tigers also, according to Islamic manuscripts like this one I put up here, also described as peculiar beings because they were closely associated with a very important figure of Islam, Ali, for that matter. Ali, uh, the Prophet's companion, son-in-law, cousin, the, in, in Shi traditions, the first Imam. Uh, Ali was is often described in many parts of the Islamic world as the Asadullah or the, the Lion of God. Now, in the Malay world and the Malay Indonesian archipelago, Ali is often described as the tiger of God, the Harimau Allah, instead. And therefore, the, the, this, this idea of tigers, tiger stories also often connect tig tigers to the figure of Ali. Now, and this really translates in the fact that certain tigers were very were venerated as saints. Now, one of the most prominent tigers who was venerated as saints was in the early 20th century was a figure called Dato Faroy. And this Dato Paroi basically means the elder of Paroi. And Paroi was a village and a settlement in Nagri Sembilan. Now, the elder of Paroi, for that matter, was a shape-shifting tiger and described as ever-living Sufi master of, of Arab origins who had migrated to the Malay Peninsula from Sumatra uh, in, in Indonesia. Now, Described in most accounts, most oral traditions and written accounts from the early 20th century, describe this, this, this Sufi tiger, this Islamic saintly tiger, as wandering across Malaya, leaving sacred footprints that believers could dig up and use as talismans. 
Now, beyond that, what was striking was that by the 1920s and 1930s, now, Dato Porai, in spite of the fact that he was ever living and roaming across the peninsula, this tiger, was venerated with a major shrine that was where there was regular practices of Quran reading, rituals of recitation, incense burning, and other rituals. Now, Dato Porai, for that matter, lived in ecotones, as I mentioned, tigers were largely roaming in ecotones of the peninsula. But he also had his own settlement in the upstream interior. In the interior, he presided over a settlement of tigers who part were described as an ideal Islamic community because they they were they were regularly they were described as reading the Quran regularly, partaking in Malay Islamic martial arts, thriving in a kind of ideal Sufi community. Now, I just want to, as a, I, I'm, I just need a few uh, minutes more, if that's fine with the organizers. Am I good on time? Oh. So You're fine. I'm sorry. I was muted. You are, don't rush. This is oh, brilliant. Okay. So please, you're doing fine on time. You have plenty, plenty of minutes left. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that I want to point out is that as, of course, I mean, these practices were coming under attack. I mean, the first anecdote that I started with mentioned an Islamic scholar and judge who would criticize these practices. Now, Dato Porai Shrine, the popularity of the shrine of this specific tiger and this word tiger would, in, would invite the rage and uh, the diatribes of a number of Malay Muslim modernists who would argue that this was this was an open cause. And, and here they were be be speaking in the same language as a number of it. English-speaking observers, as they would describe these as primitive practices or heathen practices that were really not in line with their imaginings of Islam. Now, one of the things that is striking, though, is that we find that despite reformist denunciation, Islamic tigers, tiger shrines, continue to be venerated in 20th century Malaya and Malaysia, even as the numbers of tigers declined from approximately 3,000 in the 1950s to and hundreds in the 1990s, 250 in 2022. Now, rituals at these Sufi shrines, these tiger shrines, were, 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 okay, were occasionally impeded. Indeed, what we find is that one of the things that really stops many rituals at these animal shrines is the fact that there's a huge, there's an anti-communist emergency, or Dharurat, from 1948 to 1960. There were really stop restrict practices at many of these shrines. And that's really a period of time that we find a number of these shrines stopping their patronage patterns. Now, I do want to point out here, however, that in, there are many oral traditions, miracle stories, and even newspaper reports, because there, there's a whole archive of newspaper reports on these animals, as I, I showed earlier, I mean, on, with that slide on the Kennedy visit and the saintly snake is that the altars or shrines been built for many of these animal karamats would indeed frustrate developers and post-colonial officials in Malaysia and Singapore for a while. Because for a period of time, they would even restrict further urban redevelopment, all right? encouraging for the matter devotees to resist authorities pushing further development. And on that note, I really want to shift to, I really want to shift and conclude with another merit with two more miracle stories from Singapore. And I'm, I'm shifting, and this image, as I'm showing here, of a shrine in Singapore might not be the image of Singapore that most of us associate with today. Now, I'm really taking us back to Singapore in a space that I grew up in, and sorry to break in a personal, develop, personal anecdote, but I grew up in a Singapore that was rapidly developed. I mean, for me, much of Singapore is very different from the Singapore I grew up in, unrecognizable at times. I mean, and it's strikingly, my, my, I came from a family with grandfathers who came to work as security guards at factories in Singapore, and they were very involved in this process of contributing to the red, rapid development of Singapore. But one of the things that, that I, every trip to Singapore I find is spaces of, Sing, spaces of Singapore, like West Malaysia, are disappearing in the face of urban redevelopment. And this is one of the sites. This is a Sufi shrine devoted to a female Sufi master named Siti Maryam, who was buried at the site in 1853. This shrine was demolished in April 2010. Now, nevertheless, I now this and one of the things that I want to point out is one of the figures that I had intense contact with at this shrine space was the caretaker of this shrine, Wa Ali Jangot, 
Wali Jangot became a very close friend, if I could say. Then he, I was quite uh, very saddened by the fact when he passed away in early October last year. Now, but the story I'm telling here is not just of a human saint and a human caretaker. On the, on the contrary, this is a multi-species story. The story I'm telling here is also the one of Wa, Wa, Wa Ali Jangut. How did Wa Ali become the caretaker of the shrine? Wa Ali was delivered, uh, delivered after. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to tell. You, let me begin with the story of Wa Ali's sister. Wa Ali's sister was named Siti Maimuna. Siti Maimuna was Wa Ali's elder sister and twin. The the twin was delivered, Siti Maimuna, two hours before Wa Ali. She was delivered, delivered by Wa Ali's mother. Now, Siti Maimuna was a snake, a reticulated python, to be precise. Now, at birth, uh, Wa Ali's sister, or Siti Maimuna, the reticulated, a reticulated python, was easily distinguishable from common snakes through her navel and an umbilical cord, which connected her to a human mother's placenta. Siti Maimuna was also an elite being who could fend for herself on the 40th day of her birth. Her human mother released her to the river and into the wild. Okay? The snake would continue to visit her human brother, care for him throughout her life, and would eventually lead him to this Sufi shrine and make him start making, laying his path out for him to become the caretaker of this Sufi shrine that would stand till April 2010. Now, as Wali would, would often speak to me and tell me, and many believers at the shrine would mention, was that it was often very difficult to spot Wali from his sister. And for that matter, for some believers, they would only notice the difference between the two twins because of her more reptilian marks. Okay? Now, I also want to, I just uh, want to put a quote here to, of Monk, Step, Stefano Mancuso whose three stories books reminds us that every story, like including the stories I'm telling of animals, they might sound con con about just human and non-human animals, but trees are always central to their story. And so I'm sorry if I focused on the animals for this talk. One of the things that I do want to point out here is this space that, that was being cared for by Wa'ali and his sister, all right? was one that was full of trees, landscapes, except trees and other and other plants. Now, indeed, as we see from this story, now we have another one of these, a caretaker of some of the trees of this site in Singapore until April 10, 2010 was a man named Wa'ayim. Wa'ayim would describe these trees as supernatural trees, as abodes of multiple spirits. Indeed, in in once on 14 September 20, 2009, he told me about how he woke up and saw the faces of these charismatic figures from the Malaccan Sultanate that was that destroyed in 16th century by the Portuguese. He saw the five faces of these charismatic beings on these trees. Now, and therefore, he's, as he said, he would wrap these cloths in honor of them. Now, these were supernatural trees. These was a sacred grove to be presented now, but most strikingly about this site was this tree. Now, this tree was at the site before the saint was buried in 1853. This was, a, this was a tree that had generations of history on it. Now, as all the believers at the site would mention, Wa'ali, Wa'ayim, and other believers at the site, this tree had, it had constantly withstood development and con attempts to remove it until April 2010. According to oral traditions and newspaper reports, from the in the 1980s, when there were attempts to remove this shrine site and cut this tree, the tree bled. There was blood from the tree. Now, indeed, if I quote from a Malay newspaper article, my, and I quote, I'm translating it, a Malay newspaper article on Dara Kloa Dari Poko Yandi Tabang, that basically the, the, the blood emerged from the, the tree that was being cut. Now, in the 1980s, when they tried to remove this tree, it would bleed. Beyond that, a human child would emerge out of the tree to scare away developers. Now, indeed, workers would constantly be, con would be sickened and times even died, according to this newspaper account, when they tried to cut this tree. Now, in April 2010, I was fortunate, I mean, fortunate or unfort uh, unfortunate 
to witness the demolition of the shrine. In the morning itself, I was called by Wa'ali to the site. And what happened was I witnessed there with other believers that laborers who tried to cut this tree kept getting injured. Eventually, Wa'ali had, Wa had to pray for these laborers to the saint and pray for their protection. They, had, they approached him to pray for them and to mediate with the saint and with the spirits of the tree to allow the tree to be cut. That was the only time that the tree was removed. So, I mean, this was very much, a, I just want to, now I want to say something in, in conclusion about Wa'ali. Wa'ali was, um, like many other figures central to the animal stories I've told today, was very much a product of this multi-species space of Islam. Now, he was very much involved in the Islam, uh, Islamic multispecism. He was protecting this multi-species space of the shrine. Beyond that, he was also dealing in his life beyond the fact of caring for the trees, having a, having a, a, a charismatic sister and, and, and everything else. He was also dealing with the fact of environmental crisis on a regular basis. He was a spirit medium by himself, in, in himself, now, with, with warming, with the rise of temperatures and with the spread of mosquito-borne diseases, the most lethal animal, with the spread of mosquito-borne diseases in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and partly the spread of dengue, chikungunya, yeah. one of the things that Wa'ali would be partly approached for as a spirit medium was they'd be approached by devotees and believers to speak to the spirits of mosquitoes, to repel these mosquitoes and to kill them individually. If required. Now, Wa'ali, for that matter, I mean, and I've, I've had, had the privilege of recording this, some of the conversations that we will have with individual mosquitoes, his rituals of communications with mosquitoes before killing them if required. Now, one of the things that Wa'ali, one of, in one of the last conversations I had with Wa'ali, and I want to end with this, Wa'ali Jangot said to me that one day we will all mix into the soil. He will mix into the soil so will the trees, so will the animals, so will his sister, so will the insects he killed. And some, some people might be pleased with the fact that they are being mixed into the soil. But he said that even as we mix into the soil, our stories will remain. He, he spoke to me and told me, it is up to you to share these stories or to think if they're irrelevant to share. Tira apapa, he said. Now he said, it's up to you to share these stories or think they're irrelevant to share. And he left me with a point saying that the stories you tell will have consequences. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a bit speechless, uh, Taryn. That was just extraordinary. Incredibly, um, not only illuminating, but incredibly moving. Um, the respect that you have for uh, this arena of critical stories about about life itself is really evident in the animated way that you shared with us. Um, and the stories themselves are just so powerful uh, and surprising. I love how you started with the story of the infant. And of course, we're all imagining a human baby uh, that actually turns into be a, a python and the consistency then of the story of snakes throughout, uh, as well as the uh, attention to other other life forms. I I have many, there's many questions which I want to turn quickly to the, to the audience, but if you could, could you share um, and just, I mean, this, the, the destruction of the, of the Sufi shrine is, um, and all that that represents is, of course, devastating. And I wonder what is your what is your sense of the uh, vitality of these this these dimensions of the multiple stories in Islam that preserve the uh, the animal stories or other life non human non the 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 uh, what did you call it the karamat of the of non human souls. Can you speak, most of what you presented was historic, this devastating story at the end here. What, what's your sense? Is there a revival movement here? Are, are all of these stories 
continue to be endangered themselves um, and the and the um, the lives that maintain them. Could you give us a, just a, a kind of sense of the contemporary landscape before we open it up for uh, the audience questions? I think we'd all love to hear your sense of that. Thank you, thank you so much, Tyler. I mean, there's, there's as I said, there's, a, there's such an abundance of stories that I, I often feel and I, I, one of the things I feel guilty about is whether I'm doing justice to actually sharing them and telling them. Yes. And I mean, what the, I think it's, it's a great question. I mean, first to, to specify the fact that, that the, the, the concept uh, Karamat for that matter, miracle worker, uh, be the living miracle worker, or miracle worker past. I mean, strikingly, it's often assumed that Karamat are humans. But they've historically and in the present always been been they could be they could be they could be anything. I mean, it's something that comes up even in Gosha's book, actually. You know, yeah. in the mention of Tana Baraka, uh, Tana Baraka, as he says. Now, really, you know, an island could be a Kramat, the rock could be a Kramat, a human could be a Kramat. I mean, a technology could be a Kramat. I mean, it's really what what we how we're understanding a soul. And and one one thing that's quite uh, I mean, I think it's it, going back to your question here. I think it's like it's it's undeniable that 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 clearly these shrines have depleted because of the fact of and I, I think you know it's it's often assumed that it's because of Islamic reform, but it's really, I mean, there's there's definitely been, I mean, there have been Islamic reformist critiques in the past and the present also. Right. But it's it's in a landscape of West Malaysia and, and the Malay Peninsula and even parts uh, that's really rapidly developed from the late 19th century of which from the plantations to road constructions to, to these cities that have developed. And what has come in this place is really this removal of these shrines. Now, one of the things that, that I, 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 I often found was that nevertheless, they, you know, it's easy to assume that this is a thing of a past and faded into folkloric oblivion because the stories are still shared and these figures are still there. You know, they, they're, they're often inhabiting very different spaces. So the fact that I so I wanted to end with Wa Ali Jangut's story, who passed last, who passed last year, and but the fact is that that he is a living example of these spaces and shrines still being there in both, both uh, in the Malay Peninsula itself. Sorry, I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> but, well, it's I I think I think it's it's really I think I hearing you and I I think the question actually isn't really do the do the Karamats still exist because of course they do. It's the recognition of them, the celebration of them, the honoring of them that I think uh, is clearly in jeopardy from multiple sources. Uh, and I, the uh, resonance with, with Gosh, I think, is very powerful. Um, so, I, again, I, I have so many... I, I, we have to we we have to go on a retreat together for days so I can talk to you about what you presented. Not even want to say just coffee or lunch, but because we have these great questions, I'm going to turn to some of them now. We have an attendee, anonymous attendee, who asks, "It seems like there's a push to remove the complexity of Muslim Malay identity. Uh, this relevant to your, you know, the tensions within uh, internal tensions within different interpretations of Islam. Uh, there's a uh, there's a capitalist push for development, a Marxist push for the same, and potentially explicitly hostile to religion. Muslim reformers who follow Protestant Christianity as a model of Islam, coincidentally, they seem to be creating a singular narrative of what it means to be Muslim, uh, or even perhaps just human, I would, I would add. If you agree, uh, do you think you could talk a little bit about how these three different systems arrived at the same point? of a simplified Islam. Sure. Then would you prefer I take a few questions together or I answer them individually? Why don't you why don't you take that one? That one's pretty complicated. And then and then I think well you you can also see the questions, but I'll 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 point out a few others. But why don't you respond to that one? Because I think it speaks to the many strands you're representing here, consistent with also what uh Myra was also representing. So maybe maybe tackle that one. Yeah sure, definitely Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name. It's of an anonymous. It's an anonymous oh, question. Okay. 
Justin, and I'm going to very. Uh, I hope I do it justice. So I, I think it, I spoke of the the capitalist development that has really come up in terms of the urban redevelopment. Now, not just in the spaces I spoke about in present day Malaysia, if there's an island called Pulau Besar, that's probably the largest collection of uh, of uh, Kramat shrines that you still find in one island itself. The whole island is full of Kramat shrines. The Malaccan government has been pushing a kind of for urban redevelopment in terms of developing a resort, a golf course, and clearing shrines over the past few decades. Now, these are shrines of multi-species saints there. So we see it increasing, happening on a daily basis all over the Malay Peninsula. Now, but I think your question in terms of how, for that matter, I mean, for is you know it's striking to I think it's it'd be wonderful for someone to study how Islamic reform and capitalism is really coming together at the sites because one of the things that we do have is Islamic reformists on one hand of of the of the orientation that that karamat veneration or karamat respect is un-Islamic. I mean having a very different image of and debates of Islam breaking out or whether karamat shrines are part of Islam or not. But beyond that, I think, it, and this will tie up with Diane's question also earlier, is on the other hand, even within uh, within uh, within Muslim communities, groups that, that believe that karamat respect or veneration is inherent to Islam, that karamat should are uh, integral figures of Islam. Strikingly, the debate goes deeper into whether humans only are karamat or whether animals can be kramat, whether non-humans can be kramat. And I began with that example because of that Islamic judge who was attacking that, that, that veneration of a reticulated python was not attacking the veneration of saints. He was arguing there was a human thing. So that, that is where, in, in a, I think your question is wonderful in the sense of in this world of shaping a kind of modern Malay Muslim identity, we find capitalism, religious reform really coming together and forging this identity and attacking the space of karamat. But within that space, animal karamat are being even further paraphilized or tree karamat, plant karamats are being paraphilized because they're assumed to even not inhabit that same this space. Sorry, I hope I'm answering your question, but thank you so much. <laughs> uh, wonderful. And I, again, just, as you as you identify, Ghosh really is is equating this um, diminishment um, of non-human life with the kind of, again, uh, reification of the hierarchies of, of devastation. So connecting uh, the murderous colonial um, ex, uh, actions around the disrespect for, for other non-human life and then the capacity for disrespecting other forms of human life. So that this notion of is it is it only human or is it uh, non-human, uh, Karamat? And I it's just so powerful the multiple stories that you share and the persistence of those stories. I mean, I think that's key. So I'm going to turn to Dan's really excellent question, Dan McCann. Um, what an amazing talk. I'm so moved by the people who responded to the arrival of potentially frightening animals, not with fear or loathing, but by treating them as kin. What was it that made this response possible? And I'm assuming you're, yeah, python, <laughs> tigers, um, crocodiles. Uh, was it that uh, Malays felt solidarity with the animals because both had experienced the disruption of colonialism? Was it an outgrowth of pre-colonial Malay culture or something else? Hey, should I answer that? Then? Yeah, let's just, yeah, let's just, I think these are all so rich. Let's do one at a time. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That's, that's a wonderful question. It's it's really tough to answer because, I mean, on one hand, uh, it's it's the it's it's the nature of the individual story and the individual, anim, individual animal that's being dealt with. So at, at times, for that matter, the tigers are... Uh, who, who, I mean, according to, and I'm, I'm going to really, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that we take these stories at face value. Now, according, there are stories of animals who are coming and speaking of depletion of habitats to their human family members for adoption and arguing that their depletion of habitat happened and they needed to be adopted by the human family members. They speak to them in person or in dreams. There are others of, tigers appearing as miracle workers performing miracles immediately and on the other hand uh, being respected immediately as as tigers associated with figures of islamic history there are others of of 
crocodiles at times appearing and actually even like attacking individuals, and even killing them and being understood as lawgivers in a sense of preventing transgressions. <laughs> so it's, 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 I, I, so I, I, I'm probably not doing any justice to your question, but it's, it's kind of like every, every story is like, I mean, what, what I know is, as a historian is at this moment, there's, there's so much more contact between this, this uh, megafauna and, and, and humans just because of the development and something environmental historians have, have very, very richly pointed out. But but I'm, I'm what I'm finding in the stories is everyone has a kind of individual account of them. I mean, one of the most striking stories I found uh, a miracle story is of a of a tiger who returns to a village in Nagri Milan and speaks to uh, his human family, reminding them that, that he he embodied the spirit of a that had transmigrated from a human ancestor, and to to prove it to them, he he flashed a. a golden tooth that belonged to the dead ancestor and he would he would eventually be very central to the family and uh, and be partaking in rituals in the house etc so, so sorry Dan I might not be answering your question but, but it's a wonderful question and I should think even more about it to give you a coherent answer wonderful wonderful there's this a uh, question from uh, Fatima Amadi who she and she asks, I believe she asked, does the position of these animals among Muslims in this area receive any influence, or is, are they in any way influenced from Buddhism being prevalent in the same region? So there's another. I'm lost it now, but there's also another reference from another attendee uh, about influences of Hinduism as well, which is also. Uh, so just wonder if you have any understanding of those uh, those uh, cross connections. Definitely, and thank you, thank you for those questions. Wonderful questions, indeed. I mean, there's been uh, there's been some. I mean, indeed, there's been some intellectual speculation about, like, for that matter, the role of lions in this part of the world. Just giving an example, and how lions, for that matter, associated with certain bodhisattvas, for that matter, have been really been prominent for the matter. The naming of Singapore, with the whole historical tradition in Malay, Malay hikayat or chronicles, basically arguing that a lion was spotted on the island. It's very much, I mean, many historians of Singapore is also, have associated that with a certain uh, certain image of a bodhisattva for that matter that was prominent there, that was seated on lions. Now, beyond that, many of these animals are also strikingly, a number of these animals strikingly are also described in these Malay Islamic manuscripts as associated with Hindu or Indic divinities, as you rightly pointed out. But what, what is striking here, and this is the reason why I'm referring to them as Islamic here, is that they're being fit into Islamic cosmology. So even for that matter, Shiva and animals associated with a Hindu divinity like Shiva, are being Shiva is being fit in these traditions and manuscripts into a strict Islamic cosmology. He's associated with Islamic prophets. He's, associate, he's described as a... Uh, a de devotee and servant of God, Allah. And so there's a very, so what we're finding here at this, uh, strikingly, these stories, and I think this is what really makes it much so interesting, is how we're finding uh, kind of Hindu, Buddhist traditions as being assimilated into Islamic cosmology. Now, for a number of early Malay study scholars, they kept struggling with this and saying, no, this is not Islam. It can't be Islam because there's a mention of that. <laughs> but there's a very neat Islamic cosmology that's being put here. And that's really, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so Janet Gatto is asking, um, are there any images of tigers living with human families? And I, I would just expand that. Um, with the visual representations of these multi-species connections. And I wonder what your, historically, so even without necessarily the, the uh, 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 explicit picture, but I, it's, it's clear in the story. So the question is, is there, is there, are there other media that are representing? So I, I have a, I, I should, uh, sorry, I just have a small collection of posters here. So there's two oh. people of these animals and including some on my wall probably can't be so I can't. well you're blurred you, you've got the blur on i don't know if you want to take the blur off oh. to show oh my okay one second i'm just uh 
Wonderful. So, yeah, just just one, and the rest I haven't unpacked here. Uh, uh, some posters that you would find of animals, and there are many of these saintly animals and how they're associated with figures of Islamic history. Now, uh, they're, they're mainly posters from shrines, etc., and shrine libraries and bazaars. But beyond that, you have a few photographs, indeed, like that uh, strikingly uh, a, a very prominent ethnographer in the Malay world in at the turn of century, I believe in uh, in 1900 itself, I might be getting my year wrong, 1899, 1900, would, would, would follow the Cambridge expeditions across Malaya. And indeed, he would interview and photograph a war tiger. And so we have a photograph of that. And I, I'll be happy to, I should have brought, put that on my slides. So I'm sorry, I didn't. But, but, but yeah, that's, that's the only photograph I've come across of a, of a war tiger. But, but other than that, it's, it's a lot of these religious posters and that, that, that are still very much available today. It speaks to your mind of, of, of what's remembered of these. <laughs> Wonderful. Um... I just had another question about the, uh, which is, I, I'm finding I'm finding myself feeling quite heavy hearted about the destruction of that beautiful shrine and the tree, um, and the loss of your of your of your friend who was the caretaker, um, and I just wonder, in in your previous stories, you spoke about about different ways that life is preserved after death both in other shrines and in um, potential you know different body parts. Um, and I wonder, with that particular shrine and how it might represent the destruction of other other kinds of shrines through development, are there um, any common ways that that local people are able to maintain the sacredness of 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 the karamat? Sorry, Diane, I, I lost you in between your question. I, it just... um, yeah, so just just the question of the um, d multiple forms of being able, given the destruction of the of the shrine the, of your uh, the of the of the female Sufi Sufi saint, and of course the 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 loss then of the caretaker who was also a karamat, is there in previous and the tree, there are previous stories that you shared where the. Um, either body parts or remains of the of the karamat would be repurposed essentially or, or a shrine built to then maintain the the capacity for that holiness to be able to be represented i'm wondering if in that particular shrine and other contemporary ones where development is overcoming and often destroying them are there common practices in a contemporary way where the power of the karamat is being preserved, or is that also part of what's endangered right now? That's, that's a great question. Thank you, thank you. Dan. And firstly, I want to apologize to Janet if I didn't answer her question fully earlier. I hope no, I you did. did. And, you did. And uh, so that's uh, so. A couple a couple of things. One is like we we find that uh, all kinds of remains and relics are passed on. I mean, it could be soil from sites that's being passed on, that's being preserved. At times, uh, dried, dried plants from the site are being preserved, etc. Indeed, I, I should, I should mention that one of the things that the, in my second last meeting with Wali Jangot, he gave me a rock from the site, and he told me that this is this uh, to preserve it. I, I preserve it at home. That that would be that that is talismanic. So we have we have collections of talismans from the minerals of the site that have been passed on. But the other part of this story in, is that the saint, the, when the, the site was exhumed and uh, destroyed, they, they dug and dug for the saint, but the saint remains were never found. And miracle stories uh, attest that she refused to move. So the site is still... I mean, I, I think that I'm thinking of, since you, you spoke of Amitav Ghosh, I'm thinking Amitav Ghosh mentions like, you know, the populations could be cleared from the site, but the island still remains a site of Baraka. So this, whatever emerges here, this remains a site of Baraka. And, oh. and while the talismanic uh, resources are, are being circulating from Singapore to Boston. Yeah. Ah, right, right. Wonderful, wonderful. There's an earlier question that... Um, 
uh, I will, I will, uh, it's the second of the, of the questions that um, are posed in the Q and A. The blessings of the crocodile remind, this is also from an anonymous um, attendee. The blessings of the crocodile remind me, reminds me of Mengu Pier in Sid, Pakistan. Uh, the shrine Mazar uh, remains important today and people go for the Baraka. Uh, is this a regional connection to the animal or do you think independent rise of honoring a fierce predator? I, this is a great question. No, that's a great question. The, the, so the, 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 the... The shrine Liari in uh, in Sint is uh, in is Mangupir. It's it's such. I mean, the crocodiles are Mangupir for that matter. I mean, it's 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 such a wonderful analogy in terms of looking at both sides. And I think one thing that's really striking is that even uh, even in the case of if if the Karamat is human at a site, a shrine can be devoted to a human saint. I think one of the things that, that really forces people to recognize the religiosity of animals, at least within Islamic traditions, is the fact that throughout shrines, even human shrines, you find animals devoted to saints and being respected as spiritually elite animals. So in the case of this shrine in Sindh, Pakistan, the, the, the crocodiles are believed to be spiritually elite and affiliates of the saint. Now, this is something you find across many parts of the Islamic world. I mean, it's often forgotten here I mean, with, with what has happened in many parts of the Islamic world with development, with the rise of art regimes, etc. It's even in parts of West Asia, for that matter, we know from the early ethnographic works that animals, landscapes, etc. were venerated as karamat sites. So we have a, we have a, it's, it's I, I think I'm, I'm, I mean, a wonderful question. I'm a bit hesitant to say that it's a local South or Southeast Asian thing because we, I mean, till, till the 19th century, we, we have, multiple reports of, of of all these saintly animals, plants, trees, rocks from various parts of the world where we don't find them today. So am I, I hope I'm answering the question. Thank you all. I, it makes me, it, I also, that, that question just makes me wonder, is it, would, it sounds like there are particular um, uh, karamat Either, either through particular lineages, and as you said, that there's a the lineage of the elephants, for example, um, of of a particular, um, yeah, uh, genealogy ancestral uh, that's often recorded. Is it is it that? So I'm assuming that you're going to say that if I ask the question, is all life form um, a, a karamat, essentially? Or, or is there is it something about the particularity of particular life forms, and and how might that be addressed relevant to the the just the incredible power of the life of life forms itself in all of its manifestation? Mm, great. So thank thank you, Diane. That's so good. So one thing I should clarify is that that are are the elite. I mean, and, okay. Okay. In this whole multi-species world, like the human world, the animal world or the plant world, is divided in long, all kinds of lines, and only a certain certain spiritual elite are the saints. Okay. But no, the rest too are have souls, intentionality, languages. So, in a number of the manuscripts I showed, many of them were about trapping elephants who were common elephants, common elephants who need who could be trapped. But even then, you involve speaking the souls and spirits of those elephants. They had different genealogies that cut them off from the genealogies of the elite elephants. So there was, there's, there's no, basically, like in one of a better way to put this, perhaps not putting, there's no herd. Every animal is individually spoken to, attended to, mediated. The soul, spirits of elephants are individual. They have individual genealogies. And Fascinating. So the and and I that so and some rise to an elite status because of the because of the 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 depth of spiritual power. Exactly. That's amazing. It's beautiful. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams, another speaker in our series, has a has a question. Um, thank you, Taryn. From your own perspective, with the loss of these animal and plant stories in terms of belief and consequences. Do you see a revival of these beliefs with new consequences coming back into contemporary Islamic religious life? Um, that's a tough one. Thanks. I, I hope so. 
I, I hope so. I, I really, I mean, I, I'm seeing that, that. I mean, first, thank you for the question. I mean, it's like, I do see that we're within, uh, especially there's a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, I don't, I, I mean, I'm going back to something that I believe, and I might be misquoting Dan said, I believe, in one of the, the group sessions we had after that, that, that it's, it's, you know, this, this, it's, it's a kind of, a particular understanding of a certain space or crisis, etc. Now, I think like many of many Muslim uh, groups, communities that 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 I I uh, had the privilege of of sitting with, are recognizing the fact of a certain un, a certain earth crisis in a peculiar individual way. There's no universal understanding of it, and and for some of them. The one way of going back to this is reviving these stories that were passed down across traditions. Yeah, and I think for many, for some of them, I think what's crucial to know is really to to kind of really put put that kind of multi speciesism back into conversations of Islamic sainthood, Islamic Ramadhood, etc. Or for that matter, recognizing the fact that every being has a spirit, for that matter, and. I, I hope that's answering the question. I think I'm probably not, I failed to, but. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, a quick uh, question. Um, Craig asks if there are any mention of spiders in the many miracle stories that you might have heard in your research. Oh, yes, they are. They are. So I think like, <laughs> uh, it, it's wonderful because the, the it's a great question. Thank you. Because spiders are, in many of these stories, uh, spiders are really believed to be to be uh, really noble creatures because of the fact that uh, there's a tradition, a uh, popular tradition of them protecting the Prophet Muhammad once and uh, spider webs protecting Prophet Muhammad once. So for that matter, there are, uh, you know, I mean, for the, for that matter, I was, I mean, even before I recovered these traditions, I know that one of the many pantangs or taboos or prohibitions was to kill a spider. And but but beyond that, at certain shrines, for that matter, I was I was introduced to introduced to specific spiders, and there was uh, specific spiders that even were described as Peer, Karamat, Babas, or elders, etc. And there are there are. There's, I mean, I I I'm, I'm I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. I'm, I don't want to start sharing some miracle stories, but definitely there are a number of miracle stories on these elite spiders also. <laughs> Well, we are almost against the hour here. I want to I want to say first of all on behalf of all of us in the room and all of us who are following this series and will see this recording. Thank you immensely for this incredibly moving and illuminating and animating and generative conversation. So it's incredibly rich and you are a encyclopedia of these stories and we're very very excited about your your new book that you're working on. I I also just have to say I was so moved by by your um, by your friend and the caretaker and the Karamat himself who you who recently lost and his name escaped me. I apologize, but when he said you know um, you, uh, tell these stories, they have consequences, and you are such a a tender caretaker of this important tradition, specifically through 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 him. So thank you for sharing with all of us that that powerful particular story um, of this very rich encyclopedia of stories. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. So so I want to also encourage all of you we are taking next week off because it is a holiday here in the United States next Monday, but two weeks from tonight at six o'clock on the Eastern time, uh, Matthew Ichihashi Potts will be sharing his uh, his interpretation of apocalyptic grief, reckoning with loss and wrestling with hope. So please return two weeks from tonight. Join us again. And thank you again. Um, uh, incredible presentation, Taryn. We're, we're, we're blessed for your presence with us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely two weeks, and we hope to see you back here at two weeks from tonight. Thank Good night. You. Thank you, everyone. Sponsors, Religion and Public Life at Harvard Divinity School, the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard University, the Center for the Study of World Religions, the Constellation Project, and Harvard X. 
Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.